Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, thank you. Uh, we are going to... I will ask for an approval of the agenda as presented. So moved. A second. There, moved and seconded. Any unreadiness? Hearing none, all those in favor, let it be known by the sign of aye. Aye. Those against nay, ayes have it. Thank you. Uh, what we are going to do as we wait for our guest to join, I don't see him here, so I, I don't see him yet, um, is going to cover, do a, a quick update here. Um, I was just talking to uh, uh, um, Jasmine uh, Shirley, our parliamentarian, about the voters that are happening and uh, voting and it is not happening in our district. Um, that is not a good space. Um, Jazz, before I ask you to come on, I want to talk a little bit about the update on the HB1 injunction that the NAACP Florida State Conference, along with a couple of other folk, have uh, filed litigation. We filed. Uh, I do give my, um, I'm going to be deposed on uh, Thursday the 4th. Um, and so uh, we will, I will be representing the NAACP Florida State Conference and how this works is every unit, uh, uh, every branch, youth council, high school chapter all make up what is known as the Florida State Conference. Um, and since I was the civic engagement chair um, for the state of Florida, NAACP, and because if it has, if it has to happen, it happens here in Broward, I will be um, representing the Florida State Conference, which will mean all of us here in the NAACP. Um, I'm working um, with our attorneys, um, with our general counsel to make sure that we are well represented um, when the time comes. We also have another state conference has another lawsuit on SB 90. SB 90 is what is affecting us right now. The letters that are coming in the mail, um, the confusion that's going on. Um, I'm asking you if you have a copy of both. There's, a, there's two forms of the letters. I have one because I receive one. If you all have a copy of the other letter, please make sure you hang on to it. Um, should there be a need for further uh, litigation as we move forward. Um, I continue to chair the uh, Civil Citation Juvenile Justice uh, Advisory Board. Um, we meet um, to, to make sure that we are discussing the issues that are affecting our children. And there are many. Um, we are doing everything we can to make sure that young people um, stay out of the system. Um, there is plenty that's going on that's uh, making it extremely difficult to do so. Um, and uh, since I don't see our speaker on, uh, I'm going to go to Roz, uh, Dr. Osgood, um, share with us some of the things that have been going on within our school system. Um, I know that you have to pop out and pop back, but I want it before I don't want you to leave without talking about some of the things we've experienced with our children um, happening in our schools. So if you'll share with us. Thank you, Madam President, and to all y'all that are assembled today. Um, and I will have to get off about 725. Um, I am overwhelmed right now. When I look at all of the great work that we do, all of the prayers to help our children, I'm beginning to feel extremely powerless. When I look at the violence that you see on the news and other things that you don't, you're not privy to, I see our children getting together and plotting to murder another kid. I see them coming to school reeking so much with marijuana, when they are confronted and searched, they have knives and weapons. We're at an all time high with the violence that we're seeing from the social media posts, the threats and things that are now actualizing this. You know, when you have some kids take a couple of days and say, we are gonna kill this kid and then carry it out and it's real. And let me just be clear to our community, it is happening in our schools, 
with black and brown kids. We can no longer say that it's the other kids. I think that this is a moment in time where every adult has to recommit themselves to at least one young person, if not multiple. We have to talk to our kids. You have to search their cell phones, their social media. They shouldn't be able to tell you that it's not your business. You know, you are an adult. And we have to begin to help our students get the help that they need around mental health. Let me also say this. The students that we're seeing these kind of actions from are students that are in the top 10% of their class. So a lot of times when we think about things like this, we automatic relate it to kids that are struggling in school, kids that we know are having issues. A lot of those kids cope with trauma and tragedy because they've been doing it for most of their lives. But a lot of the kids who are high achievers have a very good way of fooling us. They make good grades. They look the way we want them to look, but we don't engage them to find out what they're thinking, what they're dealing with. We have to begin to be more honest with young people about life and the pains and disappointment that comes with life. It's something that we can't escape. And we have to be transparent so we can create environments for our children to talk to us that we can help them think through these things. If kids are watching reality shows and video games all day because they don't want to talk to you, they block you out and you think they're in the room quiet watching the games, it's cool. In those games, everybody dies. But in the next episode, they're alive again. It's not reality. It's not real. So I did a social media uh, video the other day because my heart was just so heavy. And I just think as adults, we cannot just sit back when we see these things happen and say, oh, they are bad kid. They need to get the consequence. Certainly if you murder somebody, there's a consequence. But what can we do to create those environments for our kids to talk to us? And sometimes they need to talk to us about us. Sometimes we have them too early. And as we're growing up and making bad choices and decisions, it causes our children pain. We have to own it. We have to have conversations. We have to get them the counseling. We have to connect them to whoever that adult or positive person is that they will listen to. We cannot have, it's not okay for children to be plotting to literally murder other children. It's not okay for children to be threatening to shoot specific teachers in schools. We can't just say, oh, they was just kidding. They didn't mean any harm. Many of us will have problems in school. We was bullied. If you mean, you know, a lot of guys quit dating me real quick. I don't certainly had my years of heartache. You know, now when they see me and try to holler, I just laugh and keep it moving. But the pains and problems of life are real. And we have to help our children have these conversations. It's going to be nothing any of our boards or any of us can do if these actions continue. You can't murder someone and there is not a consequence, whether it's accidental or intentional. It's just the whole thought process with the children. They are are suffering. Many of them have lost loved ones. We can't expect for them to just go through a pandemic and childhood trauma and these things and just keep moving. That old adage about taking a licking and keep ticking. When you take a licking, sometimes you got to pause so you can heal. You got to pause so you can get what you need. And finally, when we think about a lot of our churches, temples, mass, synagogues, those things are not available right now to our children. So many of them don't have even the spiritual connection that really help you when you're dealing with the pains of life. So we have to begin to pay attention to our children, engage them in conversation, ask about their day create those environments where they can talk to us so that we can help them make right choices and right decisions. It's a lot right now. It really is. I mean, it's just one thing after the other with the threats, with the murder, with the guns, the knives, you know, those kinds of things that we try to have them not have in their possession. You know, why is it that a kid feel they have to bring a halt beard knife to school? You know, are they being bullied some kind of way? Is it something happening at the bus stop? What's going on 
that I now have to have a weapon when I come to school. These are real life things that we're dealing with in our school district and we can't solve the problem alone. Parents, grandparents, foster parents, you have to be engaged. You have to stand up and parent. No child should live in your house and tell you that you can't come in a bedroom or you can't look at their phone. My son Gabe is 30 years old. He pay his own phone bill, but, but you better believe every now and then I pick it up off that counter and look and see what's going on in there. We have to be connected to these kids so that we can help them with their thinking and their action and their process. And that this is a plea for me tonight as your district school board member. It is heavy right now. And we need you to engage in whatever way you can to talk to our kids. Now, I don't need you telling them that they stupid, dumb, and they ain't gonna be nothing. That's not what I'm talking about. They need love, they need support, they need encouragement, they need redirection. And if you are a person of faith, please add our children to your prayer list, to your church's prayer list, your mosque, your synagogues, whatever your faith is. Please include our kids when you're talking to whatever your higher power is, because we really need some divine intervention right now. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. And you all have heard the story, many of us today. I wish the only problem we had was that a school board member took students to a Rosie's Bar and Grill. I wish that was the only issue that we had going on. So we've got to be about uh, the business, certainly for our community, um, and realize that, you know, we, we like to say children are our future, but, you know, we've got to do better about our own to make sure that we, we really believe that. Uh, I want to go next to, um, uh, uh, on yesterday or last evening, the governor announced that the dates for the special elections. So, you know, what we have here is this. You have uh, our Congressional District 20. Um, the election will be, the primary election will be on the 2nd. And then on the January 11th, we will have the uh, general election for that seat. In addition to that, we will have the primary for, which will probably be the primary, because I see we got some tricks going on here, uh, for also uh, the, the, the seat that Perry Thurston currently holds, the Senate state Senate seat he holds, and also for the seat that Bobby DuBose uh, currently holds. Um, and so they'll happen, which you, that, that'll be interesting. But what that means is that's the first day of session. And that means that we will have no representation um, in either of those seats, and then, of course, uh, Omari Hardy in, in Palm Beach County. So it was bad before, but they will certainly have a field day because I won't be able to, for example, call Bobby and, and, and get all the ins and outs, and he'll be able to go onto the floor, and that those things, are that, that those days will have passed at that particular time. I mean, so um, the special election, um, when is qualifying? Um, Dr. Osgood, before you go? November 15th. Okay. Couple and then, weeks. okay. And so that means on the 11th is the, that is the primary. Yes. And then your general election, because I see you already have, uh, I'm assuming a young man, he will, I feel, I'm, I, feel, I feel like he will suddenly, the monies will appear. Um, and so that he can, uh, uh, he can run and make sure that you're not able to be seated um, during this special session. When is the primary? So I'm sorry, the my, general? The general is um, March 8th. Okay, so y'all see how that works, right? So we will have no representation because if a write-in person, go, uh, someone writes in, goes in there, or if there is a is a Republican or somebody else that goes in, then even uh, if that were not so, then in theory, um, the winner could be seated. Um, but since we know that there's already at least uh, uh, one Republican person who is going to run, that will force us to move to a, a, a general election in March, which means the session will go without a word from, from our, uh, those are us that are in the district as it sits now. Same thing over for the for uh, I think ninety four I believe it is that uh, uh, Bobby DuBose has, um, and I don't know all the who will get in. I know that there are there's interference from both sides uh, from the other side, 
when in each year for the last couple of uh, years we've had the election, there's been um, lots of money and lots of interference and they just watch us, you know, fight each other and that sort of thing. Um, Jazz, is anybody out there voting? And for this Congressional District 20 that's happening right now. Thank you, Madam President. The, the in-person voting at the various sites are very, very slim. I mean, just they're averaging, you know, not even, it, it's, it's shameful. <laughs> I don't even want to say the number. But when, when you have only had 400 and some odd people in person throughout all sites, that's just ridiculous. Luckily, there are many of the uh, returning ballots coming in from those who voted um, via their vote by mail method. The last I looked though, that there was only about a little over 12,000 uh, that had been come in and counted. So I have to check for today, well, tomorrow for what came in today. And then again, for what came in person today. But it is very, very um, disheartening. So what many people are doing is they're hitting their neighborhoods, canvassing again in various neighborhoods to get people to understand that they have to go out and vote. Early voting is still on until Sunday. Polls don't close until 7 o'clock. They open at 10 a.m. And then the um, actual voting day Tuesday, um, hoping that Maybe people are just going to go on Tuesday or maybe this Friday, Saturday, and or Sunday. I'm hoping that that's, that is what's going to occur. Um, but I've never seen, because this is a congressional race, I would think, and because people know um, that, you know, a lot of people didn't really realize that this special election was happening. I um, mean, I found that very hard to believe, but um, it is what it is. And unfortunately, you know, we just, we don't, we're not coming out like we should for this very important race. Now, I haven't heard things on the radio. I do know that you had indicated, Madam Prayers, that Joe Scott was on the radio today or something. Mm -hmm. But right. we, we need the radios to be blasting. Get your butts up out of that chair, out of your house, and get down and vote. And it needs to be very, very um, engaging to let people know that we got to do this. We, we cannot sit back and not have a voice through our votes. It's embarrassing. Last I checked, which I believe was last night, it was less than 20,000 uh, between the two counties. It was just around, around 20,000. Now we're talking hundreds of thousands of eligible voters. We are the second blackest uh, district other than Frederica's uh, down south. And so I know that there is a, um, there is a, there are two letters out from the supervisor of elections, which I thought um, were poorly written. I'm sure he probably went to um, his GC. Um, no offense to the judge, uh, but whoever attorney wrote that or gave him advice that judge, they was, yeah, that's not really working for me. It's very, very confusing uh, to folk. Um, you know, some people feel like, well, if I do this, you know, do, I, I ain't giving them my social security number. What they want my social security number for? I just feel like, well, I've never had to do this before. And, um, and one of our family members called and said that she had some friends who were seniors that thought that they were saying that their their uh, voter ID card had to include their full social security number. And so the message is just not happening and people are, uh, are afraid. Um, some folk even thought today that, uh, well, if it, you know, uh, I'm not going to be my vote, my vote by mail ballot won't count if I did not go on on uh, the Supervisor of, Lives, uh, of Elections website and then complete my update to give them my social and uh, and or my voter ID. So uh, it is. Uh, um, and let me just say this: the fact that that um, your vote by mail 
request forms have to now include or the quest request itself must have on file a cop uh, your last four digits of your social uh, it will not be printed anywhere but that is thank your governor for that that's going senate bill 90. the fact that your uh, vote by mails are uh, expired and you got all this language is going on thank your governor not the supervisor of elections however the explanation of it and the lateness of the letters has caused uh, a lot of confusion um, there was also uh, a PSA from the SOE that said if you mail your vote by mail ballot by Friday, i.e. tomorrow, you should be fine. It, you will not be fine. So what we're saying is, and I did speak to our legal um, Judge Holmes, um, who said that first of all, your only your vote is only gonna count once. So if you go on and you know you mail your vote by mail uh, ballot. And it's not there. You can do ballot track. You go on supervisor of elections. If it's not there, don't uh, don't wait and hope and pray that it's going to get there. Pop into an early voting site and go ahead and vote in person. When and if your vote by mail ballot uh, does reach supervisor of elections, it's simply going to show that you've already voted and it won't be accepted. That's it. You, there's no way to vote twice. If it's already counted on uh, with your vote through vote by mail, then you wouldn't be able to vote in person. So there's no way that you'd be to vote twice. But there is a way is if you mailed your vote by mail ballot, it's floating around. I know people that it took two weeks to get their original vote by mail uh, ballot done. And, you know, so that was even before things got rough. Now it's even it's even rougher. There's also an effort as usual to stop staff at the post office from uh, collecting the, the ballots and sending them to Aldridge rather than sending them to Miami because even though they go to Miami, they may not come out. And so we're asking everybody to check with your folk to determine if they have dropped off their vote by mail ballot, if they need a ride to the polls, if they're not clear, if they got the letter, if they're not um, you know, we've got to do everything. To, okay, so I, it's time out for excuses now. So what is our excuse for not voting? We're going to blame the other people now because we're not voting in our own district. Um, the, votings are, the voting is so, the numbers are so few. It's anybody's game out there. You know, that's, that's not, a, not a good idea. I, I uh, saw the numbers and we would, you know, we always look at, say, uh, e. Pat Larkin, but when I look at E. Part, e. Pat Larkin, they're not doing any bit any worse than what we got going on. The others, they're usually the lowest. Not so much anymore. I mean, it's, it is it's scary and it's embarrassing um, that that is what we are allowing to happen. Um, you know, we there's just no excuse. Was there anything else, Jazz? I, you know, I just ask everybody to continue to, um, you know, talk to your neighbors, your friends, your family members. If they haven't voted, they need to get down and do so. For those who are helping um, by calling, all of the calling uh, lists that are out there for folks who do have their ballots but have not um, returned them as of yet. And for those who, um, who are helping in that with the phone calling and the canvassing of the neighborhoods throughout the rest of the week until Tuesday. Thank you very much for everything that you are doing. We've got to make sure that this vote, that our voting numbers do increase and that we, we in, indeed engage ourselves to make sure that everyone we know get out and exercise their right to vote. Thank you. Um, and since you're talking, can you give us an update on where we are on the COVID? Uh, we're we're um, COVID. Well, COVID is COVID. Uh, we still have uh, the Delta with the strain being the most active here in Broward. Um, but there are other strains out there, as you well know. Um, but our numbers are down in terms of hospitalizations. And that's a good sign. Um, to not put that strain on the hospitals, but what we are seeing still are numbers of folks who are exposed, have come down with symptoms and infection, um, having problems. Um, we're still having those numbers go up. 
Florida is still not out of the woods as, as are many other states. And most of those people, the majority of those people are non-vaccinated folks. Vaccinations are available everywhere now. Um, folks just need to, you know, to have that conversation with their family members for those who are still on the line in terms of whether or not they want to proceed. Children are being um, vaccinated now, and that's a good thing uh, for not only that child, but the other family members uh, of that child's household and the teachers and anyone that happens to work with children. We want to make sure that our children are safeguarded um, and are not put in harm's way, is my opinion. Um, but, you know, things are, we're not out of the woods yet. Um, we do, we still do see a lot of people, though, that are not wearing their masks in public um, gatherings, whether they're going into stores or um, into doing their daily businesses of daily living and kinds of things. Um, many of the establishments are still enforcing and, and highly encouraging folks to have their mask on. You can see the sign as you walk into the grocery store, but there's still some folks that are, that are just very adamant about very adamant about they don't feel that they need to to protect themselves or other people and that is a problem because we will never get a, a full handle on this if we do not take advantage of every tool that's being offered for us to get a control of this virus thank you and uh, it looks like the chief had the time confused so i see mona has a question aha there he is uh Mona, what's your question? Are you all voting out there at Kings Point? Mona, are you able to unmute? Okay, we will come back to you. All right, so. <laughs> Mr. Oh, Punctuality is I could I could unmute now. Sorry. Okay, real quick, go ahead. Okay, I just had a comment for those um, who are going out to vote. Um, at the Tamarack Library, we're not seeing that many people. On Tuesday, we had seventy people for the day, and seventy-five drop-off uh, mail ballot. We ran into a lot of people that didn't even know that Elsie had died. I don't know why. Uh, therefore, they didn't know there was an election going on. And they're not literally people from Kings Point, they from everywhere because we are on Commercial Boulevard. Um, also, people who came to vote did not have their mask on and they didn't appreciate anybody telling them they have to wear a mask in order to go inside. So that's another thing I think as you guys are going around, please remind the people, even if, if they're dropping their vote by mail, they need to have their mask to come into the uh, library itself. Uh, so there's a lot of issues as to why people are not at the polls. Uh, Percy and I, uh, because we have uh, three precincts, we were using the precinct list in order to call people. And that's why I said a lot of people didn't know there was a voting going on here. And they feel there's not been enough advertisement for this particular election. And that's the reason why um, they're not showing up. So I, I just wanted to say that to you guys, because I've been at the polls every single day with Percy. We're the only two there and it from 10, I leave about 435 and he stays on longer. Uh, we're not getting much of a play. We're actually walking towards the community center and pulling people to come and vote uh, in order to get them to do anything. So if you could be of help to us, because we get people from Lauderdale Hill, Lauderdale Lakes, uh, Miramar, everybody we usually get, and there's hardly any coming. Yeah, we have to double down on the phone calls. I've done a couple of PSAs. Um, we will uh, we'll continue on. I think we have to probably reach out and, and touch someone, some more folk, figure out why they why they aren't voting. I, I do agree with the out, lack of outreach. Um, 
and we'll that's another conversation thank you Mona. i appreciate it thank you okay and so we have had in leadership turmoil at the city of fort lauderdale uh at the police department you know we had uh frank uh for a while um and he actually uh and he beat the curve you know whether they say five six years average frank was rolling there for a while and then he was not um and you all know that he was uh in uh he's in west palm he says he says he having the time of his life you know i know he misses fort lauderdale but whatever and so then we had uh went up with maglione maglione turned back the clock it was kind of like uh a trump and obama situation uh, whatever whatever Frank was doing, Maglione flipped the script and changed a lot of uh, changed everything. Uh, anything that we had worked with him to uh, to uh, try to make things um, uh, to diversify the department to to try to work with our community to try to actually develop um, community policing. Not that that's what Frank had, but he was he was uh, he was uh, he was being PC. And at least pretending like he was going to do. And then, of course, uh, Ragli Raglione, you know, gets uh, demoted or sent back to another position. And then we get the lady. And that was a bad idea. I don't know who thought that. All they had to do was check her personnel record. That was ridiculous. Knew we were in trouble. And so we were just flip-flopping back and forth. And so, um, you know, the decision was made to, um, we didn't get a, a good quality of folk who applied, who applied the first time the city manager said we're going to start over um and so uh we were uh NAACP was one of the groups that was invited to participate in the different in the process and to meet the candidates um most of the from what i understand most of the interviewees the different panels i believe there were four that were set up did not have the list of candidates names prior to going in so they threw them the names Cole. Um, I, on the other hand, was one of the ones who did receive the list. And so we had an opportunity to Google some of the folk. Um, some of them were, uh, had some interesting things uh, going on when we Googled. But, uh, and I, I, so I Googled uh, who would then be the guy who would become chief. Um, couldn't find anything negative, found some stuff that I actually liked, the programs that he implemented. We checked out the website of his uh, foreign police department, and it was um, uh, probably the best when it comes to transparency. Um, we asked, the, you know, the can each candidate, where are you on, you know, the data and being transparent with the community. Uh, Fort Lauderdale it was currently probably still early, so the worst. Whereas, you know, Pittsburgh, one of the best or the best. Um, and so the answer was, yes, we'll work to make sure that we're more transparent with the community. Um, we, uh, I asked about issues that affect um, people of color, but certainly black people, because this is a predominantly black organization, as you all know. Um, other people asked questions of interest and tried to match that with what we saw uh, from um, his leadership from his previous department. I check with the NAACP there to see if they had something, because usually if something's popping off, we're somebody and somebody got something to say, um, you know, and didn't find anything negative on there. Um, the interview, uh, there were some of the candidates who came and I, I, I asked the lady um, who just got, I uh, would assume she got canned from Houston down in uh, Miami. Did you know you were coming to interview at Fort Lauderdale PD? She knew nothing about the city knew nothing about anything um and so she really wasted our time um and we that was the opposite of uh Scarado here and so we uh our group which included um um uh, members from the pride center from i think uh from a number of other nonprofits um and, and good citizens who got the same thing and so we ranked um him number one um, and when the city manager came around, we were able to share with him why we figured that Mr. Scarada was the person that could lead uh, the city of Fort Lauderdale. Certainly, he was he was not internal, because if you got somebody, there was three guys that interviewed. One of them, I actually, he's a nice guy, but I didn't want anybody because they, you know, they have uh, Fort Lauderdale has. Uh, 
not the best reputation. Um, and then if it's internal, you all got they all got stuff. They owe people, and this uh, guy does not owe them. He just owes the community to do a good job and keep them safe, and you know that sort of thing. So I thought he was the best choice. Um, and so when the word came that he uh, had indeed been chosen, I was certainly um, excited to do so. Uh, we he agreed to meet uh, right away. It wasn't a thing. Well, you know, get have your people get with my people. That was not it. Um, um, unfortunately, you know, things happen. The officer passed away and he's, you know, going around like crazy. was not able to do it earlier, but at our earliest convenience, he did agree to meet and certainly agree to, uh, meet with us to introduce himself, to talk about his vision of the Fort Lauderdale Police Department and where, uh, we fit into his vision. So with that, uh, chief, if you will introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your background in law enforcement and then your vision. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Marsha. Uh, as you know, Marsha has been a, a, a resource welcoming from the interview process to the time I arrived. Uh, hopefully, I can even outperform uh, Chief Adderley. I'd like to get to the 10-year mark uh, and, 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 and change the, the narrative collectively across the board about police chiefs and their longevity or, or lack thereof in some instances. Uh, I came from Pittsburgh. I was, I was a 23 year veteran in the city of Pittsburgh. I retired as the chief of professional standards uh, and the second in command of the organization. I was their youngest assistant chief in the history of the department. And, and more importantly, that, that I brought energy and ideas to way in which we should police from accountability to transparency, to community engagement. And, and more importantly, just thinking outside the box of way policing and, and community partner and, and how we are a, a, a resource to one another. You know, oftentimes community is, is engaged as a matter of convenience or necessity following an incident and, and, and not a, a, a matter of priority and a true partner. And, and my views on policing and my views on community policing, community partnerships is about a genuine partnership built on trust where we're coming to the community as a valued partner in, in our strategies, in the way we develop policy, in the way that we hire, in the way that we promote, and, and that we're engaging in, in a relationship that's meaningful. Uh, I get here and uh, my Major London, who's off on the call, uh, talks to me about the Chiefs Community Focus Group. And I mean, it was it, it, it is exactly what I it would expect and hope for a city to have already developed and engaged and, and when I get here, I'm looking at the, their five priorities and they are exactly the same things that I see as most important for, for a police department to move forward. First thing was community policing. And what does that look like? It's a philosophy, in my opinion, as designed, it was meant to be a philosophy. It wasn't meant to be a, a program or a strategy or an initiative, something short term by a select few individuals. It was meant to be the way in which we engage our, our community in a partnership that every officer from my office to the newest recruit has a responsibility to be a community partner, a problem solver. And, and oftentimes it was it was became the responsibility of just a select few. And, and it wasn't and it wasn't a priority for our officers. So our community never got to learn or meet officers and 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 opposite. Our officers never got to learn or, or build relationships with the community. So we always try to do it in times of crisis, uh, but I'm more concerned with building relationships before crisis occurs. Uh, and, and, and that's where we start here. It is a philosophical change in what we do in Fort Lauderdale. And, and I love to be the, the, the nation's leader in, in what community police partnerships will be and how they can be effective, where you feel is valued to our, our organization as we feel is valued being part of the community. So when we got here, when I got here, I started talking about how does that work? Uh, well, the reality is you have to change everything in which we do. We have to prioritize our, the way in which our police engage with the community. We have to value the way the community engages with the police department. Again, that, that I am looking for people from the community to consult with. And, 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 to, and to advise me just as much as I can engage with you all in problem solving. And, and that's, that's one of the challenges that I think we missed 
as as police leaders is, is that we don't we don't ever or we haven't in the past truly opened up our walls to to the community to be involved in processes uh, and and how that is is impactful in, in building trust and in developing relationships. We haven't provided a, a, a platform where our officers are given the appropriate time to build relationships with the community. Uh, they, we don't prioritize, we prioritize calls for service over community engagement. We prioritize non-essential calls for service over community engagement. Uh, and, and that challenge for any police leader, any executive team is something that if, if we're not intentional about the efforts in which we go about focusing on community engagement, then, then those priorities will always out. They will always be, be a focus. They will always be the, the calls for service will always be the way in which we respond and then community engagement will be secondary and, and oftentimes just non-existent. So that was a challenge. My, my second challenge to the organization was to that we have a, a reliable violent crime reduction strategy that used data to inform our decisions that use community to engage and support, support our efforts toward focusing on those that are causing the most harm in our community. That, that I don't ever want to be the leader or be a police officer in, in a city that normalizes violence in any of our communities, that, that our communities shouldn't have to normalize violence. And, and that we put all of our efforts from the law enforcement side and the community partners, and, and that we are intentional about addressing violence. And, and so in that, we, we start focusing on, on what are reliable strategies. And we from Pittsburgh, we use reliable strategies and we use the group violence intervention strategy that didn't just focus on enforcement. It, it focused on bringing social services and it focused on, on bringing our, our, our mental health partners and, and it focused on our clergy and it focused on community all coming together to develop a strategy that was more concerned with diversion and more concerned with, with helping those members in our community than it was to incarcerate them. And then for those that would that just refuse to be a part of, of that program, then obviously we utilize the criminal justice system to, to hold them accountable. But in those five years that we start from the time we started that program to 2014 to 2019, we saw homicides decrease 42%. The city had become the safest it had ever been in 20 years. So with that, we know the strategy works and it's something that coming here, I bring with me, but I understand that it's not an enforcement alone. It's not police by themselves. It is a collective, a collective effort from our community, our judicial system, the police department working together to rid our communities of violence. And then I focus on our officers wellness. You know, a, when you think about an organization, you think about, ensuring that our officers feel that they are respected, that our officers feel that, that we, we value them. And, and, and in turn, I, I believe in a servant leader on my, on, as a behalf of myself and my leadership team is that we work for our officers. And the better we are at working for them, the better they will be at serving you. That this is a service industry and, and you are our consumer. And in that, that we have a, a, a service to provide and, and, and that it is, it is of paramount importance that we engage you and have that feedback loop to show or to evaluate how that service is delivered. So with that, you know, we start talking about equity in organization, right? And how an organization looks as it relates to leadership and, and as it relates to inclusion and diversity. Does our leadership team reflect our organization, does our organization reflect our community? And, and now I start building an inclusive leadership team. Uh, promoted 14 people since I've been here. Um, and of that, seven were either ethnic, gender, or sexual orientation minorities. Focusing on identifying those that are above and beyond qualified minority candidates to put in positions of leadership. Recognizing that if we want to be reflective of our community, our organization's leadership has to be reflective of that diversity as well. So those are some of the priorities that are in place in the very moment uh, in the way that we hire and the way that we engage. You'll see as we move forward over the next couple of months, we're developing our promotional processes and, and what that looks like. Well, there is a community function now that's going to be part of the scoring and evaluation. 
uh, so that it isn't just a scenario and someone that has some that's very good tactically or very has a tactical competence and a police acumen is able to do well. It's some way that the community looks at and goes, okay, I, how do you represent the community? How do you, how do you, what is your commitment to service? So that we add in communities engagement and involvement in even the way that we hire and promote. And, and so that community is a active participant in developing this police department. And, and that is of the, that is one of the most important roles I see community playing with our police department and the way that our police department can engage in the community, that we become valued partners for each other. And again, I say like from the beginning, not as a matter of convenience, but as a, as a, a matter of developing a relationship that's built on trust and, and that, that we do it all early, early and often and that we're continuing to engage and being honest with each other and that I build a transparent and accountable organization that is that is accountable to our consumer and our consumer is the community. So I'll stop there and open it up to either what, Marsha, if you wanna facilitate any questions, uh, if you have any questions for me, you can throw them in the chat uh, and then I'll, I'll answer them as, as we go. Okay, I have the first question. Yes. Um, so, as I understand it, Chief, you make some promotions. Um, many of those individuals are, are our members. And then I read in the paper that um, you, uh, two first two white officers are saying, you know, you're, you're being so unfair. They've been passed over. Um, then I, a couple of days later, I read in the paper, then you got two more. So you make these promotions, and as I understand it, these are certainly officers who are more than qualified, who have the time in, who have the experience, and certainly um, the education, because I know that is a, 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 you know, a thing with law enforcement you know, here, and these, these are um, several of them were black, and we'll just deal with that, um, master's degrees, years of experience um, within the rule of five, and yet um, it you know, made a a big splash and before you can, you know, even get your uniform. So tell us about the complaints from uh, those four uh, white officers and we just going to, you know, get into it. Um, and what was the basis of the complaint and how it, if it was resolved? So I guess I can, I probably need to speak generically as it relates to the complaint because it's still ongoing. So it is an EEOC complaint uh, against me for what is tabbed as, or what has been, I guess, has been described as a minority agenda. Uh, and, and in that, I, I would say it's categorically false. Uh, I have promoted qualified minority candidates. So the black candidates that I promote, things weren't equal. They were above and beyond uh, qualified as it related to their contemporaries applying for the same position. So the complaint alleges that they are equally qualified and, and that is absolutely incorrect. Uh, the, the minority candidates that were promoted were exceptionally qualified. And, and I've spoken about being intentional about diversity and given the opportunity, when I have the opportunity to promote qualified minority candidates, I will do so. And in this instance, I did exactly what I said I was going to do. When I have exceptionally qualified minority candidates, I will not miss an opportunity to promote them and put them in positions of leadership for this organization. And that's what I did in this instance. So the, with the suggestion that all things were equal and then I chose a minority is, is just false. All things weren't equal. The minority candidates that I chose were exceptional above and beyond those that they were competing against and therefore were chosen. Thank you. Um, before I go to you, Judge, let me just ask you a question, um, Chief. So tell us about the diversity of your department. I think you have around 539 or 40 officers, something like that. Can you tell us the diversity? Like how many, you know, let's, let's, let's talk black cops because we've right. had a, a history of, of having, uh, number one, if you go back to when, uh, and Mr. Walters, whom you know, during his leadership, he's a former NAACP president, you may not know that, um, but there was a consent degree because it was so bad, you know, earlier on. So 
and then getting hired and then making sure that they were not only officers on the street, but they were given an opportunity um, to hold leadership positions as well. Um, so tell us about the diversity of the city of Fort Lauderdale Police Department. So the organization is is, is diverse in, in various regards, right? So in as relates to women, it is in it's pushing upward of 26 percent uh, as it relates to uh, Hispanic or Latino uh, employees or, or officers. It, it's pushing into the low 20 percent, 20 percentile. As it relates to African American officers or Black officers, it's still in the low teens, and, and that is where I think we are. Are obviously we're not reflective of Fort Lauderdale, the city, and, and that is where our areas of improvement and our efforts need to be focused. Uh, we don't we don't have uh, a lot of Black applicants, and, and 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 therefore because we don't have Black applicants in the processes. We're not there. We're not getting the opportunity to hire either. So our my objective is is how do we engage the black community, to, it's consistent or similar to the Latino or Hispanic community, uh, and because in, when I look at our application pool, we we're not there's no shortage of Latino or Hispanic applicants, just like there's no shortage of women applicants, but there is a short of shortage of black men that apply to this police department, and I I'm trying to determine if it's the efforts of recruiting and, 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 and or it's law enforcement in general is not appealing to black men or, or what is the factors and, and, or, or aren't we seeking the support of community to, to have to, to, to back or, or, or to provide support to have black men applicants apply. And, 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 I, and that's kind of the challenge. I just don't know the answer in the moment here. Uh, we were very intentional in Pittsburgh in improving diversity with black candidates. And, and in that, that we increased, I, I tell you the five years, we increased from 9% to 22%. And, and that was the way in which we recruited and the way in which we hired. But we quit doing it in 19 when I left and Pittsburgh went right back to right around the 11 to 12 percent percentile. And, and so what is it we're doing here? I have to evaluate all of our processes. Uh, Marsha was with me last night and we talk about like, what are, do we have built in standards that don't, that disqualify urban candidates, disqualify black candidates that grow up in an urban environment and have different exposures because we create these purity tests that would only be applicable to people that lived in, in into the middle of the Everglades. Right, that we're not building a, a we don't have a, a recruitment process or a hiring strategy that focuses on a modern candidate, an urban candidate. And, and, and so looking at that, I, I use for instance that we use 20, the use of marijuana 20 times is a disqualifier. So how does that affect communities of color? Uh, it's legal in 26 states in the United States but we use it as a disqualifier. And, and does that affect the way in which we recruit minorities, specifically black men? And, and I think there's challenges in the way in which our processes are designed that, that will discourage black men from even applying to the police department. So I, that's the challenge that, that I face now. And then that's what I'm looking into to ensure that, that we're not creating the, these, these uh, artificial barriers where people don't even apply because they don't want to go through the process of embarrassment and being disqualified. And, and that's a challenge here that, uh, that we face. And, and I think it's what law enforcement faces nationally as it relates to, to, uh, to being appealing to black candidates. Okay. Judge Holmes. Hi, good evening. Uh, Chief and welcome to Fort Lauderdale. I won't hold it against you that you're from Pittsburgh. I'm from Philadelphia. So Ooh. I grew up with Frank Rizzo. So oh. I know policing good and bad when I see it. Indeed. Um, I'm, a, Indeed. I'm a former state and federal prosecutor and a county court and Broward County's longest serving black circuit judge before I retired in 2018. So I know policing. So I'll That's just bad. get to the crux of it. What, if anything, are you doing? Um, I know you said you're looking into it, but 
there have to be some measurable things to be done to engage, number one, the black community to gain the trust. Um, my tenure on the bench, I saw more prostitution stings from Fort Lauderdale than I saw from any other municipality. Um, and the majority of the defendants were black. Um, possession of marijuana, the joints, Fort Lauderdale led the, the way uh, of police agencies. Riding a bike at night without a light. I understand Thomas V. State that that's a crime, but Fort Lauderdale led the way uh, of more than any municipality, even the Broward Sheriff's Office, of making those stops and arresting Black people. I will tell you now, I, I don't know of too many people in the Northwest section of Fort Lauderdale that trust the police or that even like the police. Um, and Frank Adderley, he, he made the efforts to involve the community, um, certainly involved the NAACP and efforts to, to gain that trust. Uh, there's a substation on Cistrunk that was placed there. Uh, you know, I don't know what they're doing to, to gain the trust and admiration Nothing. of the community. Nothing. Uh, so, um, Chief, you, you've got a long road to hoe, uh, as my mama would say. Um, but if you want to be uh, in that higher echelon of chiefs that last more than five years, um, our community has to be inclusive. It has to be included in, in committees and in, in efforts. Um, and, and, you know, just sending an officer out to talk to the kids. The kids are afraid of police officers. All right. So. Can you give me some measurable attempts now that or, or things that you're putting? I know you just got here, but mm -hmm. you had to come with a plan. So I, I'd like to hear a little bit about what what your efforts are going to be. Yeah, it's, so it's it's so you start with it's a matter of trust, right? And and that I always I use the the analogy that community is when I talk about trust, it's community doesn't trust. It's not about trust that I'm going to steal your wallet. It's the community doesn't trust that our officers care to keep them safe. And, and, and that is because we haven't given the effort necessary to build that trust. Uh, we haven't made our officers available and accessible. You know, the first, the first community event I went to was a, a roll call, a front porch roll call briefing in Dorsey, Bend, Dorsey River Bend. And, and, and seeing our officers in the community engaged in, in, in relationship building that the community wanted to see our officers and our officers want to be part of the community. But oftentimes that's not the narrative. And oftentimes it's overshadowed by other tragic events and in, in with policing and communities of color, right? But we're, we, aren't, we weren't intentional about how we engage so that when I got here, but I start looking at that right away. It's our most, it's, it's the, biggest obstacle we have is, is that we're not, we're not building trust within the community. We're not utilizing. So the substation, Marshall, okay, she's first she said, you can't get in there. She's like, she was surprised they let me in. And, and because it's, while it's in the community, is it, is it a, is it a place where the community feels they can go, right? Is it being utilized as a resource for the police department, or is it just another housing facility where they go to eat lunch and, and go to, to take, to take a break? Oh, it should be a resource where, where there's engagement, where relationship building occurs. Uh, and I think that's the, where we start is, is that I need to make them available and accessible. And more importantly, that I need to prioritize that. And my leadership team needs to prioritize that same thought process that our lieutenants and sergeants have to understand that's an organizational priority. And there are measurables and metrics to, to determine whether we are we are uh, fulfilling that, are we fulfilling as an organization, my statements to the community, right? And, and so we measure that by, by our, our, our strategic management that we can see when our officers are engaged. And then we hold the officers, we hold our supervisors accountable for that engagement. And, and, and so oftentimes you see policing, they just it's kind of drive by and there's not, there's not a focus on relationship building. And, 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 but that's, there's, that's kind of organization, that's an organizational failure. 
and, and how do we how do we create an organization that supports that type of relationship building? Uh, it has to come from my office. You have to hear it from me first. And, and I believe in it. So if I believe in it, I promote a team behind me that believes in it. And then, like you heard me say when we started this, that community engagement isn't a, a matter of necessity or convenience when crisis occurs, that, that it's a philosophical it's a, philosoph it's a philosophical perspective of how policing should be. And, and it has to be ingrained in, in the foundation of the way we, we do business. And it hasn't been. And it hasn't been here because I'm hearing from the community that tells us that that hasn't happened. While we do really good things in the community, it, it's not as inclusive and engaged as we would like or pretend it to be. So from the outside, I can be rather objective and oftentimes critical of the way in which we engage, understanding that we do a good job, but we can be much better and we need to be much better so that when I sit on this call and, and I'm talking to you all as a group that you go, oh no, it is notable and it has changed. And our officers are far more engaged and our community feels like they are represented within the organization and they have input and influence in the manner in which we police. And so there are measurables. And we will, we, as we're developing them, we'll hold, we'll be held to account. I hold myself accountable. Uh, I didn't come here for a short four or five year stint, right? This is this is a career. Fort Lauderdale is going to be my home, and, and and in that, I have a vested interest in the success of this organization and the success of our community, and in that engagement and what it looks like moving forward. I said I want us to be the gold standard for community police partnerships. And, and I'm committed to that. And I believe our officers are committed to that if given the opportunity. And, and oftentimes we didn't, as a leadership team, prioritize it. So therefore, how would they be expected to do so? And, and that's the challenge. And, and I wholeheartedly believe a year from now, we won't be having the same conversation. It will look much different and, and we will be much more engaged. Our officers will be much more known to our communities and, and, and we will develop that level of trust that just doesn't exist right now. And, and that's, and I say this with, look, we didn't get here over a year or two. These are, these are decades of issues. We won't solve them in six months, but we, we will work over the next year or two. And I know this department and this city will be much different. Our community relationships will be much different five years from now than they look today. Let me ask, um, Judge, what is the policy of the state attorney's office when it comes to prosecuting marijuana? Because uh, I'm, I'm told that um, State Attorney Pryor is not uh, looking to prosecute those cases. However, that Fort Lauderdale is still choosing to arrest uh, those folk. What is the state attorney's policy? Well, I know what they say, but I see what they do. Mm -hmm. um, they say they're not going to prosecute it, so I haven't seen any diversion programs pop up for misdemeanor marijuana. Um, you know, so I'll, it's like wait and see. I know I, I don't believe any police agency has been notified by Mr. Pryor officially uh, that he his office was no longer going to prosecute misdemeanor amounts of marijuana, such as joints or blunt. Um, if, if the officer has to use a magnifying glass to get it off the ground and put it in the evidence bag, that, that's, that's really, really bad. And those residue type cases, um, kind of like a waste of time. But Mr. Pryor will have to uh, notify the agencies. Um, but, you know, uh, he's, he's, the governor has spoken. I don't think the uh, governor mentioned him specifically, but he sort of made it known that those uh, mayors and school board members and state attorneys that won't follow the law, uh, that they, they will be removed. So, um, but chief, uh, you know, it, it, even the test for THC, for those little blunts and stuff, that, that's money wasted that could go into something else. You know, I'm teaching judges from Washington and Colorado and Nevada, uh, it's legal. Um, yeah. I, I just remind them that they can't smoke it because it's against the federal law. 
But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just mind boggling. The, the, the courts are clogged with these little bitty misdemeanor amounts and, and residue amounts. I came from California. We, you could get it delivered to your house like Domino's Pizza. Uh, the reality of it is, is I want my officers to foc focus on priorities. And, and, and in, when we talk about violent crime reduction, small amount of marijuana doesn't fall into that category. We will be very intentional on holding those that are responsible for violence in our communities accountable. I, 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 I am not, and it will not be the focus of this police department to have this, this zero tolerance approach in our community to for, for never blanket policing where we just throw this net across the community and we're gonna have these, these, uh, these aggressive enforcement actions. We're gonna be very precise in, in where our efforts are directed. And that is and, and that has never that has never been fruitful to any crime reduction strategy. All it seems to do is, is enrage or be an antagonist to community police partnerships. And more importantly, goes back to building in a, in another, a, a so, sowing another seed of distrust between police and community, right? And, and so what do we prioritize? I tell you, I prioritize violent crime, but I don't, I've never prioritized. If, listen, I worked gangs my entire career before I started promoting up. That has never been a priority because it doesn't show there's, there's no stat or data that shows that arresting for those type of offenses improves violence in communities, especially in communities of color. So, so why should it be a priority for, for a police administration? It won't be in mind, and, and I'll tell you that in this call, and, I, and you'll never hear me say something here that I won't say outwardly. Uh, it, it's just the reality of the way I exist. And, and I assure you, it's not our priority. And it won't be my priority or this organization's priority that we will focus on violent crime. And, and in that, that isn't one of the that isn't one of the parameters. So you don't need a memo from Mr. Pryor. I don't need a memo, and my officers don't need a memo. And, and and I'm not worried about threats because it's not like we're abdicating our responsibility for enforcement. The the reality is we my priority and this organization's priority is violent crime, and that doesn't fall in that category. Thank I you, believe Pastor. the county also has a um, adult um, uh, diversion program for uh, small amounts of marijuana that is not being used. Uh, believe it or not, it was we. Although um, you know, uh, African Americans are most likely and are arrested more often. When it came to the usage of the countywide marijuana uh, program. It was used during the first three years out west, out in Weston and Parkland, for uh, white males, and it wasn't, you know, it's not utilized. So we need to uh, make sure that that is that you understand that there there is a program, how it works, and then kind of go from there. So we'd certainly appreciate that. Uh, we have a question from um, Nina Justice. Yeah. Good evening, Chief. Uh... Obviously, um, I'm a lifelong member of the NAACP. I'm very proud of that. I was born and raised here in Fort Lauderdale. In fact, I uh, retired from the Fort Lauderdale Police Department after 32 years of service, and I'm still back as a reserve. And I spoke to you about this before, and I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up now. Um, you know, what, and, and, and congratulations on your promotions and the, the moves that you're making thus far in our police agency because I'm inside and I get an opportunity to see some of them. But I would also like to know what measures are you uh, putting in place to seek minority candidates? That's number one, to seek them because I used to be on a recruiting team and we used to have different measures in order to go out. And, and I heard you say that it's a low um, application pool of minorities. So what, what measures are you putting in place to seek minority candidates? And the second portion of that is once you receive them, are the processes fair for the people who are applying? Because that's one thing that's, uh, you know, winding them out of the, the process because the process is not fair. It's more opinionated, in my opinion, as opposed to, uh, advocating for the, the the most qualified person. And so, I, you know, and I mentioned this to you before, I want that area looked into because I think it, 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 
it weeds out some great candidates um, based upon what they have set up right now. Well, I, I thank you for your service. And I, and I love every time that you and I speak because I get a little more insight from, from inside the walls of the police department than I would get otherwise. So please continue to be brutally honest with me. Uh, it, it will only benefit our, it will only benefit me then, which I hope in turn benefits this organization. So first, so what I've asked, so we, it, it depends on what you're talking about, about minorities, right? And and because because some will tell you that our minority hiring is is outperforming national standards. And, and it does, if you talk about gender, Latino, Hispanic, and then black. If we add those three together, it does outperform national standards. So the organization should be applauded for those efforts. However, we're talking in this instance, we're talking about black candidates. And and when I got here, I said, I want to know. So I talked to my background unit just last week, and we're, the challenge to them is I want them to, to show me, like, I want to know where our Black candidates, where the Black applicants get disqualified. And, and we, we've never even done that, 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 uh, that, that test of, 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 or the gauge of evaluation. Like, we, we don't even know where it happens. Does it happen in the oral boards? Does it happen in the application process? Uh, and... First, if we don't measure it, we'll never be able to be accountable to it. So that's what I want to know. Where are our candidates, where are minority candidates, more specifically, where are our Black candidates eliminated? And, and then let's try to determine what that cause is. Our oral boards, you know, our oral boards are, are all over the place as, as it relates to representation, and they're not consistent. And I, there's, there's a standard on there that talks about dress, and that would a Black applicant be judged more harshly because of the way they appeared to the way they dressed to come to the interview and 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 how that is being treated as as a negative factor for simply over clothing no matter what your answers were or, or or the life that you led you didn't dress according to way someone approved you or, or thought you should look and and that that can be affecting that can affect your score so if that affects your score then, then is that a standard that, that we should use as an evaluation tool? And, and more importantly, then does that have disparate impact on Black candidates? And I would suggest it most likely does, right? If, if I am able to, to make, have an opinion about your appearance at onset, then am I even, am I even capable of fairly evaluating your answers and your responses to other questions? And, and, and so, this new, the new oral board will be a, a select group of people, select group of diverse individuals, but it won't be random. That, that it will that the, these individuals will be trained. I am still working with human resources to have a community input in on these panels as well, so that we start getting some some diversity and thought, and then that also would affect scoring. Right, that we have community involved that that can evaluate differently than police officers would evaluate a candidate. And so you have to look at the entire system. The great thing about that is right now, Nina, is we have a fro where right now we're not hiring. We're not in an active recruitment. Uh, we're not in active recruitment. And because we're not in active recruitment, I have the ability before we turn it back on to, to reevaluate, reassess the process and ensure that we don't have we don't have obstacles or barriers for black candidates, minority candidates, that they are affected or judged more harshly based on the, what they wore to an interview or, or that I got three white men that were older on the interview panel and that, and they look differently at minority candidates. Whether it's true or not, the reality is I have an obligation to ensure that that, that panel look is as diverse as, as we can make it so it rep is representative of the community and the recruit that we're trying to attract. So all in all, we're, that that process is, is being overhauled, and more importantly, it will be accountable. And, and right now, it's not accountable because when I ask questions, I don't have answers. And because those questions haven't been asked in the past, then the, the, the unit that's responsible for it isn't prepared to answer it. Same with recruiting. Uh, we, the recruiting station is on Cistro. But how many people on this call know that that's where our recruiting station is operated out of? You can't uh, get it there, Chief. 
We right. Well, Martin Marshall, right? It doesn't even matter if you do know, you don't feel like you can actually go there. And, and so it's not a resource for the community. So that is something that we need to be focused on changing so that Marsha feels just as comfortable referring some young kid to the sister police station to pick up an application as she does referring them to file a police report. Let me just say that, Chief, you don't know this, but um, we work with our then commissioner to get the sub police substation on Sistron uh, Corridor. Um, that was supposed to be a substation where if I needed to file a complaint, I could. If I needed to, you all have the thing, you have to register your bike. You could go up and, you know, there's like a little meeting space. It was supposed to be for the community. So if I need to file a complaint, I shouldn't have to go over there and it's on the locking key and all that stuff y'all got going on with the other office. However, that did not, did not materialize. And so, um, I have gone there, um, before and they were not very welcoming. Um, and I actually, uh, the last time I, it's been a while since I've gone there, I went there once, uh, we were actually having an evening with the black judges, uh, judge, you, you don't know this, but so uh, we were at the Mizell Center, which is now the where that new fabulous YMCA is being built, Chief. But it used to be a, a center that we held meetings, and we had, um, you know, uh, several black judges there. I think that was the night when the year we had eleven, and so the state attorney was attending. He arrived early, and so he's in the back of the building. It's dark. He's on the corridor. He's feeling kind of jumpy. So we were supposed to have gotten, um, you know, usually Fort Lauderdale will um, send a cop because uh, we've had, you know, a couple of issues. And so I actually went uh, over to the substation to say, hey, um, can you all come a little early? You know, we've got some folk here. We want to make sure, you know, everything's good. And they were, I was outside knocking and they were inside just staring at me. And I was outside knocking. They were inside staring at me. So I said, well, we need someone to come and stand with, because uh, the state attorney is behind the Mizell Center scared. So if you all want to come out, you know, so they were like, uh, and he really was a little jumpy. And so, you know, uh, it's, and I said, well, why are you all locked up? And they're like, it's before our safety. Like you, stuff goes on outside. I know that's why I'm coming over here. So, you know, they were like, well, no. Um, they even put uh, one of the officers was in trouble over there and they put him there as a punishment. So it's been, it's not what it was supposed to be when we initially asked for it. And I'm going to ask uh, our representative, because I'm not sure if you all have formally met yet, uh, Bobby DuBose, to share with what the discussion was when the substation was uh, was agreed to be put on on, uh, on the Sistrong using our CRA dollars. Representative DuBose. <laughs> Can you hear us, Bobby? Oh, no, I can't. Uh, sorry about that, uh, Madam President. Uh, I do apologize. I just finished uh, a candidate's form that our teens at Oswald put together. And, um, you know, so I'm actually sitting in my car. Um, and I, But I have caught probably the past uh, 15, 20 minutes uh, to the new chief we haven't formally met. Congratulations. I've I uh, heard some uh, really good things, some some promising things. Uh, hopefully, uh, over time, I heard you say five years. So I'm I'm looking forward to all of that. Um, I think the question was posed as as regards to the uh, substation that we worked with the community with to put in place, and the intent was just as what uh, Madam President had talked about. Uh, unfortunately, I, it, it hasn't panned out to, to be uh, what we thought it would be. It took us some time to find a location. The things that were promised to be there aren't there. And um, I think we really missed a, a golden opportunity because at the time of that substation, uh, we had the NAT team and we were doing some really uh, aggressive things on, on the corridor to address some of the crime issues, but also building a really good relationship um, between the community and the police department. But once the door is locked, a lot of that goodwill in my attention, just in my, um, and from my um, position, just kind of faded away. Um, 
again, you know, congratulations. I look forward to uh, sitting down and, and talking to you and meeting you in a more formal way and um, enjoy, you know, the portion of the discussion that I've heard. But again, I offer my uh, apologies because uh, if anybody knows me in my office, the kids always come first. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. And, and I look forward uh, to, to more dialogue and, and committing right now that like that station should be a community resource. Uh, whether it, we're going to have that station, we're going to have the why. It, we, we won't have, there shouldn't be an excuse why our officers are not accessible and available. Uh, and, and again, that I, I don't ever fault the, our officers for what our administration hasn't prioritized. Uh, and, and so when the if police administration doesn't prioritize community police partnerships, the officers will do exactly what they're told to do. And, and in this instance, I'm seeing and I'm listening to our officers. They're like, we want to be engaged. You don't have the time. We're, we're, we're not given the resources. We're not given the direction in which we should or how we should do that. And, and, and in that, then they're, 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 they're left to be, they're left to be criticized for what I would believe are, are leadership failures in, in, in that direction. And so that's the challenge is they, that this community, that this, this station should be a community resource that, that whether we're, we're, we're gonna be partnering with the Y, we're gonna be part, that we're gonna be available here, that, that we're building relationships and we're making our officers available, we're making them accessible, that that door, I understand the safety aspects of things at times, but I'm not certain, I'm not certain that it should be a barrier to building relationships, should be a barrier where community doesn't feel welcome. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Roosevelt Walters, you had a question? Roosevelt, your hand is up. He's on mute. Mr. Walters, can you unmute? Okay. He's struggling. Okay. Thank you. So, like this. Oh, can you? I think I think you're unmuted now, Roosevelt. I see you're unmuted, but we don't hear you. Anthony Williams, you're unmuted. You had a question. I don't have a question. I'm just struggling trying to uh, participate. My uh, Wi-Fi here is pretty weak, but. Uh, do you do you need me to uh, chime in? Oh, if you have some uh, something to share with the chief, uh, he he since he's getting an opportunity to meet with some uh, informally with some retired officers there. Um, hopefully, we're trying to make sure that the Fort Lauderdale that is today uh, is not the Fort Lauderdale PD when you uh, when you were there, Amp. So hopefully, these new officers won't have to go through some of the things that uh, that you did. Well, good evening, Chief. I'm Anthony Williams. I uh, I retired as the Assistant Chief of Operations, I believe in 2014. I went to be the Chief of the School District. And during my tenure there, <laughs> I witnessed a lot. If someone tells you that there's not a racial problem within that department, you tell them I said they're a lie. Um, I heard you speak of community policing. That's, that's good news. But please know, the department has, has always been able to say that we've had community policing. They've always been able to say that because they have put five, six officers per district in a unit and say we have community policing. Then they'll ostracize those units they're, they're not, I'll just say they, they're treated differently. The emphasis has always been on heavy handed policing and not community policing, real community. Not, don't, don't mistake me. I took a lot of people to jail. I was, I was a very, very active officer, very aggressive officer. Me and my partner, Frank Folks, 
in two years, we arrested over 200, 2,000 people, I'm sorry, two years, 2,000, two officers. And some people on here can verify that, but anyway, I just need you to understand what you're up against. That union is very strong. They're gonna come after you on every aspect. They'll come, they'll pull your trash, they'll follow you. <laughs> and I know some of them on here listening. Yes, I said it. They'll tell you, they'll pull your trash, they'll film you. <laughs> they will. When I tell you, I've had bomb threats. I used to come to work as a commander, a captain, major, and I found hate notes under my door. We're gonna get you, nigga. At one time, that's right, I said it. At one time, I found uh, what I guess it was some type of clay on a vehicle, my police vehicle that I had parked in the back of the station. And I took it as a bomb threat. And that was because I stood up for at the time the union wanted to all the all the FOP members to join the NAACP to vote the current president out. And at the time, I was the president of the Black Police Officers Association, and I defended it. Absolutely wrong. It's disrespectful. And, and long story short, you can, a lot of people will tell you about it. However. The president that, that you're so well acquainted with now can, can give you the inside scoop on that because it was her. And I, I took hell for that. You know, the police culture is rough. And if you go against it, they will ostracize you. They will come after you. So I commend you on what you've done so far. Be brave, stand tall. Make the change changes that you're making, and and please know that you're not the first. When when Michael Brasfield, the older white guy, one of the chiefs in the past, his first command staff meeting, he walked in and said something is wrong with this picture. All white men. He said that, and he he vowed to change it, and he did just that. He did just that. So exercise your right to use rule of five. They've never had a problem with it before. Why is it a problem now? And, and Mar Marsha can give you my contact information. I don't want nothing from you. I'm not looking for a job. I would just simply tell you just like it is. Madam President, I yield. Thank you, uh, Chief Williams. Jasmine Shirley, your hand is up. Uh, Chief, thank you very much for attending this um, this gathering with us, and I'm, I'm very, very encouraging with what I've heard so far. You explained just a moment ago when you were speaking about uh, a role and a, I don't know if you said a presence or a role with the YMCA. Does that mean that they that you will have presence in the YMCA, uh, but we have the substation not even a block away on Sistra from them? What What will that role be? You're muted, mm -hmm. Chief. Unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. So I met with Ms. Wood from the YMCA, and, and I committed that we'd be a visible presence in the Y. It, to me, it, it is a, an environment that, that fosters engagement, that does, isn't, doesn't feel like when I talk about our police officers being available and accessible, yeah, I understand that we have a station right down the street, but this is an environment that, that fosters a, a relationship building. It gives us an opportunity to be visible in non-enforcement, in a non-enforcement environment. And and whether I, I committed that I would start that I, I officiate collegiate basketball and I want to start an urban officiating program that, and utilizing the the YMCA and and all that stands for to to facilitate that program and using our officers to be involved with our with our young people. And, and so I think the why in that instance serves as a resource for that type of interaction. Uh, it, it's also going to have an opportunity for us to recruit from there. I, I think sometimes, especially in the black community, even if, even if the Sistrunk station was designed or meant to be 
a, a, a resource for the community, it's it's still viewed as a police station. And and until we we remove that that level of distrust, we're not going to get people to voluntarily come to that station and engage. So then I feel the why can be a multiplier for us. It can be a venue that that because of what it serves and, and, and the purpose that it serves, it can be a venue where that we can have true community engagement that doesn't have, that isn't a police station. And, and more importantly, that it's in control by the police department. And, and, and so with that, I think the why is just that resource for us. Uh, and albeit a block away until we start removing some of this distrust and still, I mean, that's this drunk station. Um, it, it's, it's not even very appealing. In, in any regard for, for people to come there or, or want to come there. It, it just, it, I went there the other day and I'm, I mean, there's nothing appealing about it. So it, is the YMCA going to be, be a community venue that is more productive for that type of relationship building? Well, I do hope that as we move forward that we can make the changes that we need to make to the substation and that the Y does not become the only presence um, because we do know that the Y tends to involve themselves and take over things that are in place and not, and do, and not necessarily in the best interests of everyone, but their own. Thank you. Understood. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Sonia Burroughs, first vice president. Um, yes, thank you, Madam President. Um, and thank you, Chief, for um, spending a little time with us this evening. Um, I just wanted to follow up a little bit on what Jasmine was saying. Um, because we do have like the neighborhood parks, Carter Park, where children are also available outside of the substation. And I would just suggest that it, the, on a parent's sake, it could look like, you know, we've been asking for community involvement, even with the substation, to no avail. And then the YMCA comes on the corridor. And, and if focus is given to them, it would appear they are coming into the community, in our community. For a parent's sake, it would probably be a lot better, at least I'm speaking personally for me, that if we could start at the public like Carter Park or just somewhere where other where children hang out, Provident Park across the street. Um, but to make the YMCA your focal point to draw children, children are in the community already, not just at the YMCA. Um, and, and whatever you do at Carter Park, maybe they can bring their children there. I understand they're gonna be using some facilities at Carter Park, or there's some type of partnership with Carter Park. But I, you know, would like to see a community-based um, relationship built and not a YMCA-based that spreads into the community. Okay, and, I, and I appreciate that. And I, see, that is where I think this is, this conversation is most beneficial to me. I wouldn't, I'm not from here, so I don't know those, those other uh, venues that would produce the same results, or maybe even better results, to be quite honest. It may be more organic and grassroots than, than the institution of the Y. So I appreciate that in, information that informs my approach and, and gives me another option, another opportunity. I look at that as another opportunity for community engagement. So thank you both for providing that, that, that information. Otherwise, I, I don't know, I'm sure Madam President would have informed me at some point because she usually does and, and, and she always will, I'm certain of that. But, but I appreciate that in, input and, and I will uh, definitely utilize it in, as we develop the strategy. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, Roosevelt Walters, are you able to unmute and speak? I see your hand keeps going up and down. Mr. Walters. Something's going on the, on your end, we can't hear you. Chief Williams, did you have something else? I saw your hand going up and down. Uh, yes, ma'am, Madam President. Uh, uh, I just wanted to say, uh, Chief, you're gonna have a lot of people pulling at you, trying to kiss your ass. I'm, I'm sorry, Madam President, and, and uh, your honor, your honor. Uh, but, but I'm just telling it like it is, you know that. Um, keep your head on the swivel. Someone brings you something, ask yourself why. What's behind you? But I, I do need you to know this. I don't know what the number is now, 550, 560 of sworn. Well, you got 538? 530. 530. 
you, you got some good you got some good people there too. I, I just need you to know that. You got some people I've witnessed myself, uh police officers furnish entire homes for people in the Northwest. I've witnessed them get together and, and contribute to funerals in the Northwest. So I, I'm not please understand you got a lot of good people. But that that those bad apples, they're cancer. They cancer. And, and and sometimes sometimes you just gotta do what's right and fight the fight. I appreciate that, Chief Williams. I, I want to, I mean, I want to make it clear to this whole call. I have some great officers uh, and, and it doesn't white, black, fail, female, gay, straight. I have, there are some great men and women that represent this organization on a daily basis. And, and we'll hold those that, that don't believe in our values accountable and, and work tirelessly to separate them from this department. Uh, I've never been one to go along, to get along, and that won't start today. Uh, and that's that's a commitment that I will make, and, and I've made it to my mother and father, and, and I won't I won't change course for for any organization. So so be assured that that as I I am committed to the change that I speak of, and I have the support with whether it be the BPOA, whether it be Madam President and the NAACP or the community, we have the support to change it. And, and, and so now it's just a matter of, of putting our, all of our collective minds together and operationalizing things that we actually say matter to us. Thank you, Chief. And so as we wrap up, I wanted to say a couple of things. Um, we are gone, um, Judge Holmes uh, serves as our uh, branch general counsel. Um, the NAACP, uh, as an organization, has some reforms that we are interested in meeting with you to discuss. Um, and so we will uh, look to do that, uh, to reach out to you to discuss those, those interventions. I, um, I wanted to, one thing we didn't get to cover yesterday is that, you know, I'm very much concerned about these juvenile civil citations. And I say that because there was a time um, that... Uh, juvenile civil citation because it is pre-arrest there would not the law enforcement did not have access to the prevention web that logged in those uh, civil citations um, however that is no longer the case and so if we have a, a child who is a uh, you know who stole some now laters from Win dixie and somebody decided to waste their civil citation i'm saying that because that really happened at fort lauderdale um the kid was eight um and so and so he had a petty theft charge and i did in a civil citation i did reach out to um to, to the then state attorney and to uh to the then chief to say hey now are you really gonna waste this kid's um you know, one, they're shot at for civil citation and give them a record off of some now latest, you know. And so he said, oh, yeah, you're right. And, and so we were able to do that. But those things are logged. Those records don't go away. We found out from DJJ's uh, web, they may disappear from your section. But when you're doing your background check, check, if something comes up, you know, later that a kid got popping, it was a pre-arrest. They did what they needed to do. Is that something that will prevent a child from uh, being able to be a police officer at Fort Lauderdale PD. And civil citations are all non about their mis misdemeanors. Okay. I, and I don't believe so. That, like, I think it goes back to when you talk about creating a, a hiring practice for modern candidates, right? And that they, the children of our young people are exposed to much more than, than we, even me, obviously some people on this call, not to date any of us, but the exposure of our young people is, is much greater and, and their experiences are much different. And to be quite honest, the things that, that they are being held accountable today, we all did. It, it was just resolved in a different manner. So, so understanding that the now and later theft when you were eight should never affect the way in which we evaluate you as an adult to be a police officer. Uh, and, and we're going to take in to, to ensure that we're never, it, when given the opportunity, we don't criminalize children. And, and for instance, we talked about the, the child bringing the firearm to school. Well, while as dangerous as that was, 
And we absolutely have had influence and input to determine whether we were going to criminalize that event. We chose not to, right? Because it wasn't, it wasn't the right outcome. We also had the 12 year old that was, that threatened to cause harm to the school. While that is a, a felony and a crime, it wasn't the appropriate outcome for that child. It was more, there was, it, she was better served. And that's the first time I've actually said her gender, but she was better served being diverted to counseling and, 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 and more importantly, diverted away from the criminal justice system. And so we'll always support that as an organization. And, and so to your point, when we're talking about hiring standards that we've got to understand that, that certain petty incidents where otherwise wouldn't, shouldn't be, be life altering, we can't hold that against the candidate as either, which is also why I think about, when I think about marijuana or recreational drug use, that, that it matters in context and, and that there's not an, a one size fits all to every decision that we make. And, and, and when we have the opportunity that we, that we are, are, that we are very cognizant of how that affects our candidate pool as well. And we need to create standards that, that aren't negative, don't have negative impacts or aren't obstacles for, for diverse candidates, right? Or aren't obstacles for modern candidates. Thank you. Jasmine, did you have another question? Yes, Madam Prince, I had typed into the chat to ask Roosevelt Walters if he could please type his uh, question in since his hand is going up and down into the chat and that you can relate that question to the chief on his behalf. Okay. And I can so, say he didn't, not yet. Yeah, he may be struggling with that. Okay. Um, I do, um, I wanted to make sure that I was, I was uh, we were at a meeting on Saturday and I already talked to the chief about this, at a meeting on Saturday where someone uh, who said they were two things. They said they were the president of the Flagla Home Association and they were with the Sierra Club and uh, they felt the need to share that. Um, and that uh, the chief had gone and taken away all the liaisons officers to the community and she just had no one to call. Well, that's not true. Uh, and I said, I don't know a name. I was like, lady, that's not true. You know, so the, we when we talk about community policing, be, you know, community policing, as the chief describes it, is what we're looking for in our community, not the 10 officers or five officers or whatever that goes on that, and that the other officers, you know, they, you know, belittle them, call them names, that sort of thing. So, and, and to, so, so if someone tells you, uh, I don't know who to call because the chief has just taken away our folk and I used to be able to call, um, you know, CISA, but I don't know if I should call them now. The worst case is that, first of all, it's not true. And second of all, if you call Caesar or Captain Stone, what is he? Is he major captain? What's, what's his new rank? He's a captain. He's was, he's, if you call he's not, Captain he's Stone as say, Cecil, um, he would, if it wasn't, if he was not the contact, there was someone else designated, he would then give you the name of the person um, that you were to call. First of all, if, he, if I call him, I wouldn't want the name of the other person, but that's just me. And, uh, you know, and so it's not like, you know, all the people that we knew, not that we all know a lot of people, but we know who we know until we feel comfortable contacting those people in the case that there is an event. So I would ask that before you believe, um, you know, the madness that goes on, let's just find out um, and let's not spread all of the, the, the lies that are not true. Um, and one other thing, Chief, I, I was, you were talking about your FTOs. Um, one of the things that we did uh, when it came to uh, civil citations that, and I'm not sure if it's still on there because you have new officers coming in and now there's a new policy for uh, civil juvenile civil citations. If you would include that on your checkoff list for your FTOs when they're training their new officers as it pertains uh, specifically to uh, civil citation, I think that would be helpful as and, well. Uh, and Major London and I spoke about this yesterday. We're gonna revisit the training for civil citation again to ensure that we are providing the most recent interpretations that we are reinforcing that this is this is a, an initiative uh, and an MOU with the state attorney's office that so that if it was ever unclear of what FLPD should be doing as a result of civil citation that it will be crystal clear 
to our officers moving forward. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see um, Roosevelt's question. Um, Judge, do you have anything before we uh, close out? And I will, and that is Chief Williams number. Um, that's in the punt. Do you have anything else, Judge, before we? I, I just wanna thank the Chief for joining us tonight. And we, we weren't as stern and harsh as we, we have normally been uh, because this is your honeymoon period. Uh, but the honeymoon will end. Um, I don't know. The baby for how long the honeymoon is supposed to last? I don't know. Uh, yeah, it depends on what happened. If it happens, if something <laughs> happened tonight, it'll be over in the morning. A good six months. A good six months. Um, but, but I was I about to say, to, you're only as good as your first fuck up. I, I, I am so, so willing to work with you, um, you know, on behalf of the NAACP. Uh, President Ellison calls me and uh, we, we do need to sit down and chat about certain things. Um, I've seen it from the bench. Uh, Chief Williams has seen it from within. Um, some things that uh, have to change um, before you can move on to do the effectuate the change. And, and he, he mentioned that you've got some people who are going to oppose you. Um, but as long as you're doing right by the community, that's your biggest base, your fan base to say, hey, look, this man is working to try, um, you know, to keep the community together, keep the violence out of the community and, and have people who are willing to talk to you and your officers to tell you who the bad eggs are. But you, you're not gonna get informants out of our community because they don't trust the police. Um, and and I, I can't tell you how many court cases I've had where um, they had informants and the informants looked at me and said, they didn't do what they told me they, they promised to do. You know, wh what am I supposed to do as the judge? So I'm hoping that there will be change, um, especially uh, in Fort Lauderdale Police Department along. Um, but I will tell you one thing that I, I found out with BSO. I'm not sure you, you were saying you were looking at things that held uh, your officers uh, or people from being hired. BSO was using a psychological test. And it seemed that no black person could pass the psychological, but they could go and work in the jail, but they couldn't get out on the road. So I don't know that that may be one criteria that you should uh, look at. Um, at. Are they passing? Because I've seen, I hate to say this, I've seen some crazy cops from Fort Lauderdale and they come in and, and, and it was like, Lord Jesus, don't let me put them in jail for contempt, for lying. Um, there, there's some training that needs to be done in terms of courtroom testimony, um, you know, and, and, and of course, report writing, uh, that, that's important. So you've got your hands full, but you know what? It's like I tell the judges that I'm teaching, uh, you signed up for this, <laughs> so you applied. So uh, we're, we're gonna hold you to that, that standard. Again, welcome. Um, I'll try to find a cheesesteak for you somewhere and bring it to you. Um, and uh, what do they have in Pittsburgh? Uh, for Manny, well, we have it. We actually have it here on the beach. Permani Brothers is here. See, Lord. see, it's here. It's here, Judge Holmes. It's here. Oh, okay. Well, we'll maybe meet we'll, and I'll buy you we'll lunch share. to welcome you. <laughs> we'll, we'll share. Thank you, Madam President. We'll share a steak. Okay. Thank you. And I want to make sure that you all who are on the phone and there, uh, who are not members of the NAACP, we're asking you to join or renew your membership. The only thing that's missing uh, from the struggle is you. Um, there, someone asked you, was there a, a citizens review board? That's a whole nother discussion um, that actually has to, uh, fixing that has, is not, in, unfortunately, is not in the chief's hands. It is in your city commission's uh, hands, but we, I can, uh, I can tell you with, with Roosevelt's help um, how long that row is and where that train went off the track. Um, and so uh, we want to make sure that uh, that if there, uh, whatever the, the new complaint, or the, I'm hoping is new, some new changes to the complaint process um, is, we will come back and share with that. And the chief and I will meet that, talk about that on a separate uh, meeting. It's part of our focus, but we're going to walk through and see what that process looks like. Um, because if even if it's um, not sustain we want it on the record so that we can establish um you know a record for if for when you say uh you know we always say well you know this this officer has no sustained complaints but do they have any complaints and we've learned the different uh, ways in which 
those uh, Fort Lauderdale has played around with that. Uh, and we want we want you to know that we uh, we we know the tricks. We've enlightened you, so we will make sure that we can get. We only thing that we're asking when a complaint is filed for you to start from the middle. Don't assume that um, that your officer is right. Or don't even assume that I'm right. Can you start from the middle and then follow where it goes as far as that goes? Um, and with that said, uh, make sure everyone gets out and vote. Make sure you tell folk that you have to uh, vote. McChief, since you live here now, make sure that you register and vote um, oh. because you will. Uh, I'm sorry. I've been you live here now. Was, I haven't missed a vote since I was 18. I was sure okay. I won't miss one here. Mm-hmm. Just let's see if, what does that say? Leadership officers who speak Spanish Creole. Okay. Do, does have leadership staff who uh, officers who speak Spanish and Creole. I want them to speak some Spanish and Creole. I told I was telling the chief that when we had a, a kid who got hit um, a couple of Fridays ago, the officers came and they did everything that they needed to do, except not one of them engaged the people to say, you okay, we're here, rescue's coming, none of that stuff. So I thought it would have been a perfect opportunity. They did everything. They made sure that that rescue came, claimed they cleared the traffic, you know, all those things, but they did not, you know, just say anything, um, you know, to, to the community. And I, but I did say thank you to the sergeant that was there because they did an awesome job, but I don't know if they were concerned about some other stuff that was going on. They were just didn't really seem comfortable. So we have got uh, certainly achieved some work to do, but, but the overall job um, was uh, stupendous when it came to that, when it came to that. Uh, Representative DeBoss. Uh, Madam President, you were speaking about voting and encourage everyone to vote. I think that we should emphasize and make it clear uh, to folks to not mail in their ballots, to make sure if they're holding on to an absentee ballot that they need to take it in. Yeah, vote for the candidate of your choice, but just vote. Call your folk because we are out of hundreds of thousands. We it's 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 a. Uh, it's a, almost a, a crime. We're, we're in court now. The NAACP is fighting the voter suppression laws in the Bill 90, and we are not even exercising our vote to uh, our vote as we stand. We need to vote like our lives depend on it because they actually do. And with that, uh, Judge Holmes, if you will take us out, please. Father, we thank you tonight for this meeting. We thank you for those that have gathered, and we thank you, God, for the new police chief of the city of Fort Lauderdale. Chief Sheruto, I ask you, God, to go with him, guide him, guard his heart and his mind, that he'll make the right decisions concerning the people that he has chosen to protect and to serve. God, we ask you for your blessings on our president, that she may continue to lead this organization, and to Representative DeBose and, uh, and Dr. Osgood, and to all the elected officials here, uh, know that you have a responsibility to the people that you were elected to serve and give us grace, give us favor, keep us safe in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. Okay.